right, so we started at the movie club for The Talented Mr. Ripley, where we also kind of touched on Purple Noon, and then earlier this week we talked about Ripley Underground's adaptation, if you want to call it that. So, inevitably, we end up here now with the two adaptations of Ripley's Game, one of which shares that title and The American Friend. Vin Vendors' movie from 1977. So, as far as how, how these two kind of came to be, uh, to start off with, we have The American Friend, where I guess Vendors was a really big fan of uh, Patricia Highsmith and wanted to adapt something, but since the ones that he wanted were taken already, like the rights were already taken... She had Ripley's Game, which apparently wasn't published yet at the time, and so he got a hold of that and was able to adapt it in, in his own way. This is very much a Vim Vendor's movie. Um, despite the fact that it is, when you hear about how loosely it's based on the book, it is kind of surprising to watch it back and realize how much of the book is still in it, um, while also definitely being his own sort of standalone movie. And... As far as Ripley's Game goes, apparently it didn't have much of a reputation at all. I remember seeing this, like, when I got this DVD, I think it wasn't too long after it came out, because it was just kind of in the cheap section of, like, cheap stores. Um, like, it was, like, there were a lot of copies that were just kind of laying around. It's this movie that just kind of came into being, it seemed like, because it didn't have a theatrical run. Apparently what it was, was I guess New Line was really caught up in the Rings trilogy. That there were some stuff like this that were smaller that they were just kind of practically throwing away. So they just kind of nonchalantly released it to like cable. And that's how that's how Ripley's Game got out, which is really insane to think about now. But um, yeah, so two totally different journeys to the screen and two totally different visions also. Um, as far as how they went about adapting it. So, I guess to talk about the two Ripleys, um, Malkovich seems pretty much perfect, where not only are we dealing with a more seasoned and older Ripley now, but it's a Ripley that's kind of embraced the fact that his reputation is out, and the fact that everybody's going to give him the side eye, like everybody's under the impression he might be a murderer, or at the very least, uh, a con man. Like, at the very least. <laughs> um, but either way, he's untrustworthy, but he's still able to basically exist in society because it's still only just rumors. He's still just a mysterious person. And just all of these things just sort of scream Malkovich, <laughs> I feel like. And the thing about it also is, what's great about this is that even though this is also kind of its own standalone movie, at least that seems seems to be what the goal was, so it's not directly related to Anthony Mangala's movie with Matt Damon, but it, it obviously it's going to you know promote itself as that, like many of them do. Like uh, Ripley Underground did that also, where they, they really play on talented in the... Uh, tagline and th i still like this this tagline of older wise or more talented like that's a way to it it makes the point like it kind of connects itself but also it's building up that the character is potentially even more dangerous uh than we've known him to be and maybe and maybe more petty also as he goes on believe it or not so, um, we still see how he can intellectually dance circles around people, and his interests can seem very sort of... If you look at it from uh, Jonathan's standpoint, maybe a bit over-extravagant and tacky, um, but depending on where you're coming from. But, um, obviously, taking in all of the finer things in life, uh, just also with maybe a side of murder or a scheme here and there that uh, will get him, you know, multiple millions of dollars. Kind of like this opening scene which is, funnily enough, set in Berlin, given that the setting of The American Friend is Germany. Um, and in, in most of Ripley's game, in most of the movie Ripley's Game is Italy, most of the book is France. Or maybe all the book is France, come to think of it. Um, but yeah, so this opening scene, about it being a standalone movie, where we see this deal going on, and they, they bring in the idea of, you know, the art and the forgeries that he got into, that was introduced in Ripley Underground's book. And that's sort of carrying over, and that's where he's sort of making his money now. And he found that niche. And then the idea of him being impulsive, like we talked about before, where even though he's very, very calculated, and he's very his he takes his sociopathy to these places of really 
being able to benefit himself because of how he can work out situations ahead of time and be like 10 steps ahead of everybody. But the, the also the thing about Tom Ripley is he gets impulsive really fast. So if he's if he is going to kill you, it's going to happen one way or the other. Um, but he'll he'll and he'll he'll find his way around that later because he always will. He'll always get away with it. So when we see this opening scene, it does feel like this scene was basically put here because not not only does it like you know have ties to Reeves' story as we go on, but. I think the idea of introducing him to who might potentially be a new audience, like somebody who's sort of coming across this movie first when they go into Ripley, which I feel like most of the Ripley movies you can pretty much do that with, where you can just kind of go in and with the American Friend, it kind of it kind of helps. It might be less confusing to know Ripley Underground before you go into the American Friend, even though it's a an adaptation of Ripley's game, technically, but, um, to show those, like, how sophisticated he is, but then also how quickly he can turn to his impulses and kill somebody and get violent and then steal, um, and how all of this is wrapped up in this one opening scene, like, what it took, like, when you watch the talented Mr. Ripley's movie, and you see how long it took him to kill Dickie, um, and how that's all sort of, we kind of go quickly on that journey, like in fast forward in this opening scene in Ripley's game to kind of get the audience to where, what kind of person Ripley is and what he's capable of. So I love the way they handled that. And then talking about the pettiness, um, where it's like in, in this one, his, um, Jonathan's slight towards him that sets the whole thing off is more blatant. Where I think in the book, um, he just, like, sneers at him. Where, it, as here, he, like, actually r really kind of lays into him at this party, not realizing he can overhear him. But the thing about it also is what we've set up about Ripley and how sort of cold he is and kind of emotionless he is and how he's much more... Well, everybody else is busy having emotions. Um, he's just calculating and using these, like, to his advantage or, you know, locking them away for future usage or something. Um, but here we actually see those lack of emotions, I guess you could say, that we typically see in him, and how that's sort of, like, set off by the pain that he feels. Um, like, set aside by this pain that actually comes through for once, and it's almost startling to see how genuinely offended he is by what Jonathan was saying about him to these people. And it's like, could that just be the reputation? Could that be something that genuinely gets inside him and just, like, brings his whole inner house of cards down or whatever it is? Um, but either way, Jonathan obviously makes a huge impact on him in the smallest way. And like I said, sets off the whole sadistic game that goes on throughout this movie. And, like I said, the way Malcolm is able to portray that while also having this sort of wicked sense of humor to him to where he's like he kind of amuses himself we get that a lot in the books also when we're kind of hearing it from his perspective um where he has this sort of dark way of making himself like not necessarily making himself you know in hysterics but he can like say something that's only clever to him because it it touches into a territory that only he knows and it's usually in this really depraved place um so, but i like how even though I love, it, as weird as it is, it's so fascinating and fun to be inside his mind and see how depraved it is when you read the books. So when you're watching a movie or you're watching this particular Malkovich portrayal of him, the fact that we're kind of getting that from the outside, and so it's like the only per it feels like the only person that really knows the inner workings and the decision making that's going on here is Malkovich himself. So when we get moments like stuff that's not acknowledged at all by anybody in the movie, visibly. When he goes to Jonathan's shop and he's talking and he says, like, um... He says, like, how are you? And Ripley's response is, life goes on. And it's like, and it's, and it's just taken as any other response, and that's it. But when we remember that he's talking to somebody that is presumably terminally ill... Um, the response, life goes on, is an interesting one, and seems very deliberate, um, despite the fact that we never see any even dark amusement in himself. It's all probably way internalized. Like, if that was a line out of the book, he would have acknowledged to himself, oh, and, he, and he's also terminally ill, that's hilarious. 
Um, so that's the stuff that I feel like you can actually see in Malkovich's, perf Malkovich's performance. Even, and I don't necessarily think you have to know the Ripley of the books to completely get um, some like satisfaction of seeing how well Malkovich portrays that and how he does feel almost right off the page uh, when you see him through Malkovich's perspective. And the sort of um, that also comes through in like the arrogance, I guess you could say. When he, because you'll notice when you watch it, he has this sort of, like he doesn't seem to care what's right out in the public. Like when uh, they're talking about the groat with Reeves, and he just kind of hands it to him, and he's walking around in public with it, just sort of waving it around, and then he uses it on Reeves's wrist, and they're still like right here in the view of everybody. And you'll notice that nobody's kind of reacting, and it's like this is basically where Ripley has set himself throughout the last three stories of the books um, is that he actually says in the movie that he, he doesn't worry about getting caught. Like, he doesn't even necessarily think about being caught because it's just kind of not going to happen. And the way they kind of show that in scenes like this, where it's like it's he's just able to do this stuff with seemingly no fear whatsoever... Um, and also the way that seems to have rubbed off on Reeves a little bit, like the scene when he pays off Jonathan the first time and he just hands him the money, like right in this public restaurant. He, Jonathan even reacts to it. Um, and it's like, these guys just live in another world at this point because they've gotten away with so much. And it's like that just, all of that just really puts you in the place that Ripley has set up for himself. Um, and, and it's really fantastic. And like, especially through this performance of Malkovich's that has so many nuances and you could probably watch this movie 10 times over and catch a new nuance in his performance every time whether it be like a, a slight sort of facial expression change or like something in his eyes or something or even like a gesture or something um like the way i, I love the way he gives him the belated birthday present and instead of saying you're welcome he just kind of does that almost like a well i had to shrug <laughs> um almost like because obviously one of the things that makes the story come around is how ripley's guilt almost uncharacteristically kind of started to get to him with the whole Jonathan thing. and But you can only see it in these tiny little nuances you have to really look for. And I love how much they portray the character that way. Like I said, the only, the only thing that would have made the character more visible to the audience is if there was like a voiceover, which thank God there isn't, because uh, it gives Malkovich so much to work with. So that's a lot. <laughs> about Malkovich's portrayal of Ripley. So, to go to uh, The American Friend, where he's played by Dennis Hopper in a cowboy hat, um, what's really interesting about this it is it, it is to my understanding that this w it, the performance in the movie overall, I guess, had to grow on Patricia Highsmith herself. Um, but a lot of people tend to kind of be put off when you get to know Tom Ripley in a very certain way. Um, especially if you've seen later adaptations that came after The American Friend that are really sort of, seem much more book-specific, like uh, Malkovich's or Damon's. Because the other thing about Malkovich is he actually seems like he could believably be Malkovich's, Rip or uh, Matt Damon's Ripley much older. So um, the idea of Dennis Hopper's Ripley, you think about the fact of two things, which is number one, this movie is was made in the 70s. The book was published in the 70s also, but there was something really specific going on with movies in the 70s. And the movies were in like a totally different place at this point. And while that was while this was more of kind of a Hollywood thing still, it does feel a bit widespread and the 70s were a very special decade as far as movies go and as far as this big change that was happening and movies were getting like grittier and darker and going more all out and, like, and kind of not as clean in the sense of what could happen to major characters and stuff like that. Like, like major characters could die, major characters could be insane. Like, a main character could be, you know, a psychopath. So, somebody, that, there were a few, quite a few people, but one of the people that was at the front lines of this change in the late 60s and early 70s in movies going in a different direction and having a different feel was Dennis Hopper. <laughs> so whether it be his roles or Easy Rider itself that he, you know, directed and starred in also, um, Dennis Hopper was absolutely one of the poster children for 
the seventies or the decade where movies aren't fucking around anymore. Um, and so what I like to think of it as is while Hopper's Ripley may not be from the books by any means whatsoever, it does feel like, let's say the Ripley of the books died at some point and then he was reincarnated in a seventies movie. This is, I feel like we're in the right territory with Dennis Hopper's portrayal where it's like, it's obviously a different kind of Ripley. He's got a much more boisterous and Dennis Hoppery personality. Um, he's he's a less sociopath, more psychopath, but still those tendencies and those motivations are still in there. He's still, if he gets slighted, he's going to want to ruin you in some way or the other. And that's the thing also about Jonathan's story is the fact that while they play up that it's falsified, that uh, his condition is worsening, there's still something terminal about insulting Tom Ripley. So it's like, even if his condition isn't worsening, as soon as he slighted Tom Ripley in some way, that was basically it. That was basically the beginning of the end of his life, regardless of whether it was his health or a situation he was going to be getting into. So it was inevitable from that point. And what I really love that the American Friend does is talking about the slight... Where we talked about in um, the movie for Ripley's Game, it's much more blatant, where he's just shit-talking him to a room full of people. Um, in the American Friend, they brilliantly found a way to tie in Ripley Underground into it. Where we have this plot where he has a forger who is, it's not Bernard in, in this one, but um, it is a character played by Nicholas Ray, interestingly enough, where he, Vendor's intentionally cast like a lot of directors once he, once he cast Hopper, which was an interesting choice, because uh, Samuel Fuller is also interestingly cast as one of like the key antagonists that comes in later. Um, but yeah, talking about going the forgery route, um, where there's the moment in Ripley Underground where the events of Ripley Underground get set off because Murchison notices the difference in the blues in the paintings and realizes that they might be forgeries. And I love the fact that they took that element and made it Jonathan noticing that at an auction. And so that's why he's put off by Ripley and why he doesn't shake Ripley's hand. And that's the slight in this movie that gets Jonathan wrapped up in the assassination plot here with uh, Minot in this case. So, um, I think it's, I think Reeves' n last name is Minot in the books also, but they don't bring that up in the, in Ripley, Ripley's Games movie. Um, so, I love the way they tied Ripley Underground into this, and like I said, what we see here might be an even better, ad the very little pieces of it might be a better adaptation of Ripley Underground than the actual movie we talked about a few days ago. So, yeah, so, all in all, I'm, I'm really okay with, uh, Hopper's very different interpretation because um, like we were saying, it is a very different movie, despite the fact that it still has a lot of the book intact. A surprising amount of the book intact, given how many changes it does make. Um, so, to talk about um, Jonathan's place here and his um, portrayals throughout it, what I really liked about DeGray Scott's performance here is the fact that it does seem like they're going to make... Jonathan a bit more unlikable because it's not something sort of as minor as it is as, as in regards to why Ripley's put off by him but it's um it almost makes him look like he's because obviously we know Ripley is somebody that feels like he's much more sophisticated than everybody else so it's almost like it is nice in a way to see Ripley get put in his place for once and kind of, like I said, see this pain in him that we don't typically see. Um, but the idea of it eventually making Jonathan sympathetic, it does not feel like Jonathan is headed towards being a sympathetic character in that scene where he's shit-talking Ripley. So the way that they're able to get us to that point, and they're able to get us there pretty quickly, I think says a lot about how they set up Jonathan as a character in this movie and the Grey Scott's performance. Um... And, and I, I also like how this might seem like it's too much, but I actually kind of like that the movie for Ripley's Game adds more motivation to Jonathan because it does seem like a big factor in this story in general, in both movies and in the book, is 
getting Jonathan to transform from a down-on-his-luck family man with a nice little business, living a peaceful life, to an assassin uh, is a very big leap uh, that only Tom Ripley could have foreseen. So, as far as them putting him in this place of, yeah, he feels like he has nothing to lose because he's under the impression that he's terminally ill and he has, you know, no time, um, and, and his family needs some sort of support to be left with, and because uh, otherwise, you know, it'll be like his entire life was a failure. So, you could probably buy that could be enough, especially if it's somebody that's, like, really close to death, but adding on these little things about, um, there's the thing where... His wife, who's named Sarah in this, played by Lena Headey, um, she works in, like, that bookshop, and she's got that really sleazy boss that he catches, like, looking up her skirt and stuff like that. And it's, like, to put that in his mindset that after he's... I think it's after he's gotten the offer, too, from Raves, where it's... He's in a place to where, because he's not making the money he could be, and they're not making the money they could be, he's the reason she's in that position, where she has to get all of by her boss every day. Um, and so there's that, to the point that it even interrupts, you know, when they're in bed. Like, he can't even perform thinking about it. And then there's this, and then there's the stuff that Ripley comes in. Ripley with, like, his little samurai comments, just, where he, Jonathan doesn't even notice them, he just slips them in there. Um, when they pull up to the house, and their son is outside, I think he's, I think he's named Matthew in this one, and he's David in this one. Um, and Ripley says, you know... Oh, if I had a son like that, I'm afraid I'd do anything for him. Like, literally anything. And so he's just... It sounds like casual conversation to Jonathan. We know where Ripley's coming from, and we know the plot of the movie, so it sounds blatant to us, but to Jonathan, it just sounds like any other comment. Um, so everything is sneaking into his mind here and corrupting him, essentially. And so I like that they added just a little more... Just a little more pieces of that. Um, to get Jonathan to that place and that mindset. Um, and, uh, as, and, and, you know, with Bruno Gans, it's the same way where when we see him as this, you know, family man who's been put in this place and he has this, these scenes that are nice with his wife and then with his kid. I think the scenes that really stand out with Gans, though, are the scenes where he's alone. Um, and we have just him doing these little mundane things, but they're done very cinematically. Like, whether it's just him putting a frame together... Or when he's, like, with what that gold sheet, whatever it is. Um, and it's just watching him do these mundane things so cinematically. And it's like, you get the sense this is somebody whose mind is constantly turning in some way or another. Um, and, like, even like maybe even before he thought he was terminally ill, this is a guy who was, like, always kind of... His mind was always going in a direction. And so it was just a matter of what path this vulnerable mind now is going to go down can probably be very easily put on a particular path. And, of course, that's exactly what Ripley takes advantage of and, and Minot takes advantage of. Um, what I like also about what um, Ripley's game, the book and the movie, do... The movie has a particular scene especially that the American friend didn't really go into was how... Jonathan's wife sort of becomes an adversary in her own way to Ripley. There's a great scene in the movie for Ripley's Game where they there's this scene where they're painting together, and it's this sort of nice, tender moment between them, but then, like, in the middle of this moment, uh, she starts to get a bit put off by him, and it kind of starts to maybe see a darkness that maybe Jonathan can't quite see yet. Jonathan's gonna see up close and personal soon, but she kind of saw it first, so she probably saw everything coming with Ripley much sooner, which makes much more sense as the movie goes on, and when it's revealed to everybody what Ripley can be capable of and what they witness him doing, um, it, it all makes sense, it's especially the moment when she spits in his face at the end, um, which she does in the book also, but um, I'm not even sure which one I prefer because they both are very effective, where it's right after Jonathan's death she does it in the movie, and in the book, it's, like, long after the fact. They, like, run into each other in public, and he's going to say something, but the only interaction is her spitting in his face. Um, and so I, I like this sort of adversary thing going on with them, where it's like, he doesn't he doesn't feel like she's an enemy, but she definitely feels like he's an enemy. It's a kind of a one-sided thing, but um, that honestly, that's all the more beauty to it, because 
I don't think Ripley cares enough about people to have a sworn enemy of any kind. Um, so, yeah. So, um, as far also as the suspense um, that we kind of build up to, obviously both of these movies and the book itself are going to have two, at least two scenes in the middle that are going to be key scenes of suspense and then obviously the climax later. But to talk about how these build up, I love honestly how it builds up to this sort of crescendo where it starts off as one person killing one person, then it's Jonathan and Ripley killing multiple people, and then the climax just is insane. Um, and it got it kind of gets more insane the more you go, where there's less carnage in the book during the climax, then there's a little more carnage in The American Friend, and then there's a lot more carnage in Ripley's game. <laughs> um, but before we get to that point, there's this first scene where it's the first killing that Jonathan has to do, and once again, the idea that this is a whole different thing to him. This is something that Jonathan's... This is a road that Jonathan's never been down, probably never thought he'd be down, and this is his first go-around with it. So build-up is going to be really key here as we watch in real time this person who never thought they'd be here is about to kill somebody um, purely out of desperation and like they feel like they have nothing else to lose. So there's not as much build-up in Ripley's game. I like the setting in Ripley's game where it's the, um, the zoo and you hear like the bugs and the sound of the bugs sort of intensifies um, as the scene builds up. And then there's the moment where like Reeves says... Oh, it's a zoo, but there won't be any kids around because school's in. Don't worry about it. And then a fucking field trip shows up, like, right before he's about to do it. And he has to wait for this whole thing to die down. Hope that the guy's still there alone when this whole thing clears out. And then he can finally do it. And it's really great and really, really well executed and well done. Um, but, with that said, this scene, this train station scene in The American Friend is something else entirely. Might be one of the best suspense scenes in at least the 70s, and that's saying something. <laughs> like, you like you could argue it in movies ever, but even if you just narrow it down to the 70s, that's a really high bar for suspenseful scenes. And the way they just drag this out, it's almost like Sergio Leone, how much they drag this out. Um, it's like a scene right out of Once Upon a Time in the West. Um, but, yeah, so... It's this excruciating buildup, excruciating in the best possible way. Um, and the target arrives, the target misses the train, and so he has to wait on him there. They, and they're, they're right there with each other. Like, this could happen at any moment. But then they get on the train, and then there's more waiting. The target is right there, but there's people around. And then there's the whole scene through the train station itself. He goes forward and back and up and down, and it's just, you just wait and you wait, and it's like you can just see this person having to do this, and you can feel what they're feeling, <laughs> and it's and it's a perfect scene. It's a perfect scene of suspense. Um, and then there's the other layer of this, where you think about the depraved angles that Ripley comes from. Um, like, forget that, you know, Minos kind of setting this whole thing up, but, you know, Ripley's the one that inserts Jonathan into this, and there's the whole sort of, like, depraved layers to this. So, to add more depraved layers, we have to think about the fact that, like I said, this movie is set in Germany, so Jonathan is now a German character, and they make it known that the target is a Jewish guy. So it's, so now this hit has been set up that the protagonist of this story is a German guy. And we have been put in a position now, through the context of this story, that we are potentially rooting because we've come to feel sympathetic for Jonathan, um, and now we're in this place where we're rooting for a German guy to kill a Jewish guy. And it's like, to add that layer of depravity 
to make our minds go there <laughs> and to put us in that situation here where, like Jonathan in the story itself, it was just a step-by-step -step thing. It, took, it was one stepping stone, then another, then another, and we're here in this moment. Jonathan's here killing a man. We're here rooting for a German to kill a Jewish guy. <laughs> it's wild. And that's not even to take into account the future, <laughs> where if I, I mean, maybe Wings of Desire might contradict this, but I would say Bruno Ganz's most well-known role um, is in Downfall. So if you, and if you're aware of Downfall, uh, you know who Bruno Ganz plays in that. So, like I said, ju there's just layers to this, even unintended layers, like the Gans downfall connection, um, where we're just reaching levels of depravity here <laughs> that the audience goes to, and the movie just takes us there so naturally. And that's, and that's the beauty also of Vendors, because Vendors is somebody where when you look at, like, you know, Paris, Texas is the first thing I think of when I think of Vendors. Um, and most people will probably go to his documentaries, but you can look at those in the same way where a lot of Venders' narrative movies so almost feel like documentaries in a way because it does feel like we're just watching real people in real locations, and Venders can make you feel like any location is lived in. Like, he's obviously, he's known for how lived in he makes American locations. Uh, obviously, Paris, Texas is sort of counterpart with Don't, Don't Come Knocking, um, does this a lot also, but yeah, you can just feel like you've lived in a place forever that Venders introduces you to. And the fact that the American friend proves that he can do that with probably anywhere in the world, um, and how he can put you in these places and surround you with these very real feelings and these people that you feel connected to and feel like real people, and then put them in situations where they run into somebody like Tom Ripley, who can only exist in literature because nobody... <laughs> it's this layered yet somehow sophisticated and depraved can exist <laughs> and there he, and like even Hopper's interpretation um, even it obviously is even more so lives in seemingly an even more heightened reality because even even the mansion that he lives in because when we look at Malkovich's mansion it's like you know even though you know Jonathan went off about how you know tacky and over you know showing off money that it was. Um, it still felt like this sort of real place that's like, like somebody lives there and somebody put a lot of effort into making this their space. Um, Hopper's mansion is big and it's a mansion, but it, it looks, pra with the exception of the one bedroom that's like just covered in that red, there's a lot of the vendors like red and gr like the red and then the green lights. Uh, Vendors loves his green lights. Um, apart from that bedroom, this mansion looks like it's abandoned. And it's like you can sense the very sort of empty existence that he has. And where, like he's, he's in this sort of rich place, but there's just something so empty about it. Especially with the, um, the only seemingly seeming company that he has is when he talks to himself in that tape recorder and he says the... You know, like, the only thing to fear is fear itself, and, like, just these platitudes. And it's, like, and it's so... There's something so unsettling to me about the look of that mansion and knowing the incarnation of Ripley that lives in it. Um, and it's under the impression that he's living this high, sort of sophisticated lifestyle. Um, and it's... Yeah. Um, I got lost in what we were even talking about. Um, we were talking about the initial hit. Um... And, yeah, so to talk about how this escalates and when Ripley starts to get involved and Jonathan starts to realize that Ripley's involved and the story goes up quite a few notches. You can sense it in the book and in both movies. Like, these these movies and the book are great, but when Ripley shows up on that train in the middle for the second hit, um, like, it feels like all bets are off and everything's about to go off in a in glorious fashion. And so... It is interesting to me that it feels like the um, the American Friends version of this train scene is closer to the book because we have the whole thing where Ripley almost falls off the train and be becomes like an action sequence, yet somehow doesn't feel out of place. Like it's like the way the suspense ramped up enough to it and how 
it's kind of still working on the sus all the suspense, the ten minutes of suspense that was built up in the um, the first hit scene is now built up and crescendoed into this moment, which, like I said, can go full-blown action and feel like we've built up to it, and it's this explosion of sorts. Um, and, and, like I said, it introduces what... This is, in The American Friend, this is when we're introduced to what Hopper's Ripley is most capable of as far as killing and getting involved actually in the action. Um, and Malkovich has a different approach where he kind of comes in. He, he almost seems inconvenienced, uh, when Malkovich comes in. And what I love about this is this sort of, like I said, the wicked sense of humor that Ripley's hiding within himself that only he really experiences in his own mind. Um, like I said, we only know this because the book is told from his perspective. But, um, or mostly from his perspective. But the idea of um, this scene almost... There's almost something slapstick about the way the hit is done on the train in Ripley's game. Um, where everybody's sort of piling into the bathroom, and he hangs the guy from behind the door, and he makes that, you know, comment about, you know, it's more crowded than usual and stuff like that. He says the line, uh, like, he asks uh, Jonathan to keep his watch because he says if anything happens to it, he'll kill everybody on the train. And it's like, it's such a throwaway statement, but we know to not... I mean, I can't imagine Tom Ripley killing everybody on the train, but you have to consider it a possibility if he says that, <laughs> at the very least. Um, and yeah, so the way this scene plays out almost comedically, but the fact that it plays out almost comedically almost makes it even more disturbing, because we, the way we see it comedically pretty much puts us in the mindset of Ripley and how he looks at murder, um, especially murder as brutal as having to groat somebody. Um, so, like I said, the way both of those handle that scene in the different ways, like I said, the, the American Friend's surprisingly being closer to the book, but I feel like Ripley's game actually kind of shows us more of the depravity of Ripley when um, we see just how brutal it is, but the way it's you know, set up, um, the way it's staged, is so unexpected in this really great way. And so, now, this is when shit is going to start hitting the fan, and what's interesting also is, Manon and the American Friend is definitely unsavory, but I do find it interesting that Ray Winstone's incarnation of Reeves is kind of like, almost feels like the primary antagonist of Ripley's Games movie. Um, where you get I mean, it's hard to, when Tom Ripley's involved, it's hard to say who's a protagonist and an antagonist. It gets really blurry. Um, but I feel like they really play up Ray Winstone's Reeves as a full-on bad guy to the story. Um, which does add a certain quality to it, and feels like it kind of puts us on a particular path. Um, which is good. Because it could be easy to lose your way in this area. Because I do think the American friend does start to meander a bit in between the second hit and the climax, but we'll talk about why I don't think that's actually a bad thing. Um, so just hold off on that for a second, but um, as far as portraying Reeves as, like, the bad guy, um, what I really liked about this is that it does ramp up the tension more because it's like he's going after Jonathan specifically and threatening his family and stuff like that, and he's bringing all of this to Ripley. He's bringing all of this to the house. And what I think is especially satisfying about this is Reeves's end, where obviously Mano is going to survive the American friend, and I think um, Reeves is in the other two books that come after Ripley's game, so he like stays a character. But I actually like the idea of not only Reeves being killed, but Reeves being killed so unceremoniously, where they just come across his body after they've killed everybody else. He was just killed off screen at some point, and he was gonna get disposed of after all this. Um, and I love I love that moment where they find him in the trunk, and Ripley's carrying a dead body, and he just drops it when he sees him. Um, and then he only, it's almost like he emotes for a second. For a second, he's almost surprised. Um, and that's, that's as close as he can, he's gonna get to an emotion in Ripley's game, is he's almost surprised sometimes. <laughs> um, and I like the fact that 
the reason I think that's satisfying is that it always did feel like, even though Reeves doesn't necessarily feel like some primary antagonist in the book, I do remember reading the book and thinking that Reeves got off awfully easy for being the whole reason this happened, for bringing them to the house and all that stuff. Um, so to see this, like I said, I think it helps a lot also that this movie seems to have intended to be a standalone movie. Um, that they could just go ahead and kill Reeves while they were at it. I, I find that satisfying. It's, like I said, and the fact that the death he kind of deserves is an unceremonious one off screen and he's just found later. Like Ripley even has that great line at the beginning where he says, uh, he's basically threatening Reeves for even showing up at his house. And he says the line of, um, are you going to tell me what you're doing here, or is a, tri is a truffling pig going to find you in somewhere in the woods two months from now? Um, and the, the way you can just see the animosity between them and how that builds throughout the movie, I feel like is a good dynamic throughout it. Like I said, the scene where he garrotes his wrist, too, um, where it's just like, he's not having any of Reeves' shit, but then in the next scene, Reeves will show that he's just going to do anything anyway. And to kind of see this up against... Ripley and the way that he is is a really interesting dynamic to watch throughout. Um, so I actually like that addition of it. Even if, you know, people, especially like maybe Bo Pierce, might think it's too much. Um, I'm, I'm okay. As a standalone story, as far as this movie goes, I'm perfectly okay with that kind of Reeves. Um, and like I said, giving us another sort of direction with the antagonist. Um, but that's not to say that... Um, I was talking about the levity of the idea that the scene is almost the scene on the train is almost played out comedically. Um, with uh, the American friend, there's also moments of levity as we go into the climax. Um, there's actually there's one that starts on the train itself when we have um, the moment where he needs his ticket punched and he slides it under the door. Um, is this nice little moment of levity after the intensity of the scene? But then as it goes on, there is a vibe that we get in The American Friend that we don't get in Ripley's Game, or the book even, which is um, this friendship that's built, like this actual genuine friendship that seems to be building between Ripley and Jonathan. Even though Ripley is still kind of incapable of these kind of feelings, it's still interesting to see, especially Hopper's version of him, um, to kind of see him almost warming up to somebody, almost. Like I said... In every, uh, every story in the first three, he always gets an attachment to somebody, whether it's Dickie in The Town of Mr. Ripley or Bernard in Ripley Underground. Um, but with Jonathan, it's like kind of in a way we haven't seen before, where he's like, it's like he s almost seems to respect Jonathan more than he's respected anybody up to this point. Um, because there was something very sinister about his attachments to Dickie and Bernard. Um, whereas here, it is something much more, it could be something much more sympathetic because he does have the moment in the book where he talks about the fact that the reason he goes and helps Jonathan on the train is because guilt was kind of starting to rear its head a little bit, um, as far as getting Jonathan mixed up in this. Um, cause there's even the moment in, um, there's even the moment in the American Friend where Jonathan apologizes and gives him the picture, um, for not shaking his hand. So with that especially, you can it feels right that they kind of start actually having these moments between them, where there's the moment where he like offers him food and then you know drops it, and then when he hands him the cigarette and he says, uh, "I'm thinking about you all the time" and stuff like that, and they just they have these genuine laughs between them. like it looks like Dennis Hopper and Bruno Gans laughing together, which makes it all the more believable that it's Ripley and Jonathan laughing together. Um, and then that's when the climax kicks in, where, like I said, we have these bits of escalation. And, like I said, this is the part where I said that the American friend, prior to the climax, might feel like it's meandering a little bit. But here's the thing about that and why I don't mind is, yeah, Ripley's Game does feel like a tighter movie. Um, and it does its ending does feel more climatic because there's, like, a bit more death in it and... Um, and like I said, there's, there's the moment when there's always some sort of levity to it where he, they blow up the car and while Jonathan's like having this big revelation moment of, oh my God, is it all over? Um, Ripley's just ordering flowers and he's getting ready to go to, um, Louisa's concert, who's, who's in place of Eloise from the books, uh, who's just nowhere to be found in the American friend, of course, because we talked about that sort of said he, he seems so alone in that mansion and solitary in that mansion. Um, but 
Yeah, but as far as it meandering, I almost think that's a... I, I don't even use that term necessarily to talk about the American friend in a negative way. Because, um, like I said, it only if because it makes Ripley's Game feel like a tighter movie. Because Ripley's Game is a tight movie anyway, um, as far as, like, being concise and everything, you know, hitting those beats. Because even in the moments in Ripley's Game where they have to wait all night into the morning for anybody to show up for the climax to happen, um, it still feels like it's happening at a very steady pace. Um, but the thing about this is, if there is one director, if, the, like, if there was one list of directors that would be very, very short of who I don't mind just lingering on and just letting us live in the moment, Vendors would definitely be on that list for all the reasons I talked about before of being able to let us live in locations and feel like we've lived there our whole lives, basically, um, with just the way he shoots them and it's and set, just sets us in, in those worlds in general, lets them feel very natural in their way. Um, and, and you can just sort of stay in his movies, like, just seemingly forever. Like, Paris, Texas is, what, two and a half hours? And you never feel that, ever. You just feel like you live in that movie. It's like you... It's, it's almost like when that movie is over, you're like, oh, shit, I was just watching a movie for two and a half hours. Um, that's the kind of thing that Vendors is capable of, and why I think it's beneficial in his movies, that sometimes they feel like they're meandering. Because um, it's just sort of adding to the immersive factor of them. And it's... And, and, and as far as, you know, a movie like The American Friend in general, also, when you talk about movies that might be considered artsy by comparison to more conventional movies, um, there's, some, there's something that... Um, uh, when you look at this, you'll see the Criterion Collection, obviously. And somebody who has been who has made great contributions to discussion when it comes to the Criterion Collection is Bill Hader. Like any thing you can find of Bill Hader talking about movies, especially like art house movies, is worth listening to. And there was a moment at the end of a Q and A he was doing for Barry with John Mulaney um, hosting. And right before it ends, somebody asked him about his, you know, his work with Criterion. And he was talking about those movies where sometimes you have to ask yourself if you really love these movies and you love watching these movies and seeking out movies like this. Do you really love those movies or are you just trying to be, do you just want to be part of a conversation? And then he stopped and he said... But no, so, sometimes I just want to watch The American Friend. He used The American Friend as an example. Um, and I know exactly where it's coming from. It's like, yeah, it can seem artsy, it can seem moran meandering, but sometimes you just want to watch movies like The American Friend and go to those places and let a director take you there. And so as far as like picking one over the other, it's really hard to say. I, I feel like I'm more likely to go back to The American Friend for that reason. Or like I said, if I'm just looking for a concise movie... Um, with a good narrative and, a, and a, an incredible John Malkovich performance. Um, and DeGray Scott, too, cannot be discounted. Um, yeah, Ripley's Game is definitely far beyond the straight-to-cable movie it was basically sold as. It was just put out there as. Um, like I said, movies like The American Friend are just not something that you see all the time. And they give you this sort of rare experience. And I just... That's the kind of thing I always like to come back to, so that's how I would go as far as, like, saying one over the other, but I said, as far as adaptations of the book, working together, um, the book is basically mostly here. There's the whole hit-and-run thing in the book, where it's, like, playing up, you know, how suspicious is Ripley, um, and it kind of plays with that a little more, but, you know, apart from that missing, like I said, if you put the two movies together, you've basically got the book, more or less. Um, and so, and they both work in their own ways, like I said, even if Hopper seems like he's from a totally different world, like I said, I, I feel like s movies in the 70s, especially movies like this in the 70s, these suspenseful thrillers in the 70s, were a totally different monster of their own anyway, and Dennis Hopper was obviously absolutely his own thing, and like I said, broke, was at the front lines breaking movies off into a whole new thing, um, and so it's just so satisfying as a movie lover to come across movies like The American Friend, of course. So, um, that's, I think, where I'm going to leave this. So, the next thing tomorrow is going to be another versus in a completely different territory. Um, 
we're going to go to Nickelodeon territory. Uh, classic and, I guess you could say, current a little bit. Um, or current and current. Um, I've lost track. But uh, that, And then we're going to go on through uh, September. After that's going to be the movie club for Falling Down and then uh, uh, Q&A. And then we're going to continue from there with more verses and other segments and stuff like that until all through October. So uh, until uh, the next thing, I think that's it.